Welcome to our seminar part five about how the evolution theory has uh, influenced the rise of communism, socialism, Marxism, Nazism, and the New World Order. Folks, evolution is not just a dumb idea, it's a dangerous philosophy. And I don't leave my gorgeous wife and travel all the time and speak 700 times a year because I like being gone. <laughs> There's a war going on. And I want to help win the war. There's a real battle going on, and some people don't even comprehend what's happening. Now, this, uh, like I said, is not my wife. It's just a picture of her. And we live in Pensacola, Florida. We've been there since 1989. January of 89, we moved to Pensacola, Florida. We have three kids, one of each. They are all married now, and all six of them work in my ministry. So it's a real blessing having everybody right there uh, in the hometown. No grandkids yet. Need to have a long talk with those, those kids. All right. Kip Kinkle said, if there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There is no God, only hate. Where did a 15-year-old kid get a philosophy like this anyway? On May 21st, 1998, 15-year-old Kip Kingle, a student at Thurston High School, allegedly entered the school cafeteria, fired more than 50 rounds from a semi-automatic rifle. 26 students were injured, two were killed, Later, the bodies of Kinkle's parents were found in his home. He was then arrested and taken to police headquarters where he attempted to murder a detective during his initial questioning. He was not isolated from other students and got into minor kid-type difficulties every once in a while. However, there was no indication during his, high school, during his school years that he had severe mental or behavioral problems. I've known him who he was since middle school. He was a friendly kid with a quick smile and he was well-liked. He had many friends because he attended the school district for many years. Both of his parents were teachers within the same district, and they were well loved and respected by all the other students and staff. They were not typical, they were the typical all American family who lived in an upscale home in a rural subdivision of lovely homes and spent countless hours with their children. The parents were praised by every neighbor, friend, and fellow employee as devoted to their children. They fully participated in all their children's school activities, took them on cultural trips during vacations, etc. To date, however, there has been no closure about why Kip Kinkle murdered his parents, two students, and shot 26 other schoolmates. Kip said in a poem that he wrote called Love Sucks, he said it's easier to hate than love because there is so much more hate than, and misery in the world than there is love and peace. Some people say that you should love everyone, but that is impossible. Look at our history. It is full of death, depression, rape, wars, and diseases. I also do not believe in love at first sight, but I do believe in hate at first sight. Therefore, love is a much harder feeling to experience. If there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There is no God, only hate. What causes a student to feel this way? What's going on? At Columbine High School, the kids that did the shooting, this article uh, came out in Rocky Mountain News. They said their clothes may give a clue to the thinking of these teenagers. The autopsy report for one of the killers documents that on the day of the tragedy, he was wearing black combat boots, a black glove on his right hand, and a white t-shirt with the inscription, Natural Selection, on the front. This kid was a real strong believer in evolution. Right after the Columbine shooting, almost instantaneously, five more students were from within the Springfield School District were arrested for threatening to murder students, principals, or teachers. In the adjacent school districts, more students were arrested for violent threats. And in one case, an elementary school boy shot five of his classmates with a BB gun while they were playing out in the yard. Folks, what's going on? What I want to try to do in this seminar is give you a more clear picture of what kids are being taught, why they believe the way they believe, what's in these textbooks, and how the evolution philosophy is really responsible for a lot of the things we're seeing in our society today. I taught school 15 years, have a PhD in education. I've now spoken on this topic to about 700 times a year for the last 13 years. This is an active study of mine. I really, really want to help. I go visit prisons all the time. I have went and visited the two boys in Arkansas that shot everybody in Arkansas. I sat across the table for two hours and talked to those boys. We, our ministry donates thousands and thousands of dollars worth of materials to prisons and to prisoners. We're putting our money where our mouth is, okay? We would like to help. 
I would like to give you my unbiased opinion of what I think is causing the problem in our society. In our seminar part one, we talked about the Big Bang Theory and the age of the earth. In part two, we explained why the people lived to be 900 years old before the flood came in the days of Noah. What was the Garden of Eden like? Seminar part three, we talked about dinosaurs, where they fit into history. They're part of the normal creation. They were made on the day six along with the rest of the animals. They lived with Adam and Eve in the garden. Noah took them on the ark. Probably babies, of course. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. Uh, after the flood, people killed most of them. They called them dragons. And there could be a few still alive today. On our seminar part four videotape, we talked about lies in the textbooks. Things that kids have to face every day that are simply not true. They're being lied to. I mean, there's no kind way to say it, okay? There are 30 or 40 some basic lies in every single textbook that I have seen. And all of them are designed to get the kids to believe in evolution. Now, in this session, we're going to focus on the last 150 years of history to see what the evolution theory has done to people's thinking process. Let's review some of what we covered on part four, and then we'll discuss racism, communism, Nazism, and the coming New World Order. Coming soon, folks, to a city near you, and then tell you, after we get you all scared when you see what's going on, then we're going to tell you what you should do about it. Okay? God's in charge. Don't get nervous. James Hutton, back in the late 1700s, started the idea in modern society that the earth is billions of years old. And we mentioned in seminar four that this was a time of anti-monarchy, get rid of the king and establish a democracy. The Laodicean age, Revelation chapter three, the rule of the people. Well, James Hutton's book influenced a young lawyer named Sir Charles Lyell, and Charles Lyell wrote this book in 1830. There were a variety of people involved in this. It's hard to pin it on one person, but Charles Lyell certainly has to be one of the key players responsible for bringing us the evolution theory. He's the guy who invented the geologic column, which you kids have to study in school. And the geologic column does not exist in the world except in the textbooks. We covered video number four. We covered all about the geologic column. This fellow says, I myself have little doubt that in England it was the long age uniformitarian geology and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. And by the way, England today is a pagan nation. And I will quickly say, America is also a pagan nation. I don't know if we ever were a Christian nation, but we're not now. And we might as well get used to it, folks. We have to reach them like you reach the pagans, like they did in Acts chapter 17, with the creation message. Charles Darwin who wrote the book Origin of Species, and there's more to the title. We'll cover that in a minute. He was strongly influenced by quite a few folks. He was influenced by Lyell. He was influenced by a guy named Malthus. Now, Malthus had written a book saying, there are more people born than can possibly survive. So it's best if the weaker die off. Well, Darwin read that and believed it and said, wow, well then, okay. That goes along with my theory of evolution. Um, James Hutton's book came out in 1795. Charles Lyell took away the flood, and his book came out in 1830. Darwin's book came out in 1859, and he took away the creator. And boy, for the next 50 years, we saw the rise of all sorts of interesting philosophies. After all, if there is no God, well, then we must be God. And that led immediately to the rise of communism, socialism, Marxism, and the New World Order. Um, Fred Hoyle, a famous British astrophysicist, said, I am haunted by a conviction that the nihilistic, nihilistic philosophy, which so-called educated opinion chose to adopt following the publication of The Origin of Species, committed mankind to a course of automatic self-destruction. A doomsday was then set ticking. Well, Fred, I agree. Most of what we're seeing today really started 150 years ago when people rejected God. See, there are four great questions and two ways to answer them. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going when I die? Evolution tries to offer four answers to those four questions. Creation offers an answer to those questions also. See, if creation is true, there are two ways to look at the world. Some people look at it and say, wow, it's incredible design. There must be a designer. That's the creation worldview. Other people say, nope, just evolved all by itself. The Bible says God created the heaven and the earth. But some people are able, are able to look at this world and say with, an honest, with a straight face, you know, there's amazing. It's a big bang made this from nothing. 
That's the humanist worldview. See, humanists put humans in God's place. They say man is God. Humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. That's the first plank in the humanist manifesto. Hmm. Interesting. Evolution is the foundation for humanism. This fellow wrote a book, and in his book he said, Do humanists believe in a supreme being? Emphatically, yes, that supreme being is man. Humanists have no knowledge of any being more supreme. Hmm. This guy says, the turning point in history will be the moment that man becomes aware that the only God of man is man himself. Now, just who owns this world anyway? People get this idea, I am God. 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 Hey, Gabriel, come and listen to this. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> oh, we're not such big shots, folks, okay? You're not God, okay? And the job's not even available anyway, okay? See, if evolution is true, then who owns this world? Fundamental question. Who owns the world? Who owns you? Who makes the rules? How do you decide right from wrong anyway? If evolution is true, how are kids supposed to decide right from wrong? They have no moral standard, no moral compass to go by. If man is God, and this is what a humanism means, then the strongest make the rules. Might makes right. That's a natural philosophy that flows from evolution. There is no absolute standard, and there's no possible way to tell right from wrong. During the Civil War, one man decided he did not want to get involved on either side. So he put on a Yankee coat and rebel pants. He said, now they'll both leave me alone. Well, after the battle, he was found dead. His Yankee coat was full of rebel bullet holes, and his rebel pants were full of Yankee bullet holes. <laughs> Folks, the problem is very simple. There's a war going on. We are in the center of the battlefield. This is the greatest war in history. All you need to do is decide who you want to fight for and get busy and work for your general. You cannot be neutral. You are either going to serve the Lord or you're going to serve the devil. You cannot be neutral in this war. There is a battle going on. Now, we as Christians have a tremendous advantage. We have a book that tells us how it turns out. See? And I read the last chapter, and we win. Okay? So what I'm going to share with you tonight might be a little scary in some points, but listen, don't get nervous. Just it's time to get busy. It's time to pour on the coals. We're going to trace a little bit of the history of the war against God to try to give you an understanding so you can see how it fits in with what we should be doing today. See, God created the world and he makes the rules. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He created it. About 6,000 years ago this happened. Satan, somewhere along the line shortly after that, decided he wanted to be God. I suspect that Satan fell from heaven about 100 years after the creation. Certainly before Cain and Abel were born. That's the first date we've got. Adam was 130 when that happened. We cover more on that on video number seven. But Lucifer, who became the devil, the Bible says he was perfect in his days, in his ways, from the day he was created. See, he was one of the created beings. And Exodus 20 tells us everything was created in six days. So Lucifer also was one of the created beings during those six days. He did not fall from heaven before the creation, okay? Ezekiel tells us his heart was lifted up because of his beauty and his riches and his power. And God said, I'm going to cast you to the ground. Isaiah tells us, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Did you know it is Satan that is weakening the nations? He said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. See, Satan wants to be God, but the job is not available, and he's all upset about that. So he's decided, since he can't be God, he's going to destroy God's creation, which is us. The Bible says, yet... Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? I think when we see Satan, we're going to say, That's it? 
This puny little fella, he was the one causing all the trouble? How many saw the Wizard of Oz, you know, when Dorothy finally got behind that curtain and saw that little old man, you know, back there pulling the strings and making the smoke? And This is the guy that did all this? <laughs> Whenever I think of this verse, I think of the Wizard of Oz, you know. Satan's a puny little man who thinks he's, gonna, he's doing great things. And we're all going to be amazed at how puny he is when we get to see him. This is the man that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof and opened not the house of his prisoners? Well, in the meantime, things are looking pretty bleak, okay? Satan and his followers are busy making their plans to rule the world. Kind of like Pinky and the Brain. How many have seen that show, Pinky and the Brain? <laughs> That's hilarious, okay? But we don't need to be nervous, folks. In Psalms chapter 2, the Bible tells us, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Did you know, God sees everything that's going on. He sees these people planning to rule the world, and he's laughing about it. And if we're God's children, you just stay close to God, and everything will be fine, okay? There are some troublous times coming, folks, in the very near future. There have been more Christians killed in the last 100 years than in the last 1,000 years before that. There's a real persecution of Christians going on all across this planet. It hasn't hit America very bad yet, but it's coming, folks. Satan tricked Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said? Notice the first thing he did was to raise doubts about God's word. The second thing he said was, Ye shall not surely die. Now he is calling God a liar. He's denying God's word. The third thing he said to Eve was, Ye shall be as God's. He deified mankind. Eve, you do what I tell you, and you get to be God. Boy, the Islams have followed that one, haven't they? So have the Muslims. And, I mean, the Muslims, the religion teaches, you know, when you die, if you're a good Muslim, you get to go to heaven and have 72 wives. You get to be a God of your own little universe. The Mormons teach the same idea. I mean, 72 mother-in-laws. That's not heaven, okay. Uh, Actually, my wife had a great mother-in-law. But uh, uh, <laughs> Satan's technique has always been the same thing, folks, okay? He wants to make you doubt God's word. He wants to deny God's word. And he wants to deify mankind. Ye shall be as gods. That's what he did to Jesus, remember? After when Jesus was tempted, he said, Hey, Jesus, fall down and worship me. I will give you all these kingdoms. He always does the same thing, folks. His tricks are the same. The, Lord, the devil took him up into a tall mountain and said, all these kingdoms of the world and the glory of them will I give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus didn't fall for it. He said, get thee behind, get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. You know, a satanic high priest named Alistair Crawley claimed that his demon, Oasis, uh, I, I was, told him the year 2000 would mark the end of the superstition of Christianity and the beginning of the golden age when those possessing the will to dominate and conquer would ascend to godhood. Now, Robin, you do a lot of taping of uh, satanic type stuff and, you know, get into this, uh, and Robin's running the camera back here. The Satan, Satan worshipers think they're going to get to become God. It's silly now, but, you know, they're teaching man has evolved as far as he can go physically, and next we're going to evolve spiritually where we get to realize we are God. See, what you believe determines your behavior. Belief determines your behavior. A lot of folks have attempted to rule the world because of their philosophy. They think they are God. Now, the Bible says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Philosophy comes from the word philio, which means love of. Sophie means man's wisdom. The love of man's wisdom, philosophy. Dr. Henry Morris has a great book, Tracing the History of Evolutionary Thought. If I had to recommend five books to read for a person that wants to get involved in the creation movement, this would certainly be one of those five. You need to read this one to see the history of evolution, called The Long War Against God. Now, some people reasoned, if there is no God, and if man evolved from dark-skinned apes, then the colored man must be less evolved than others. Racism has always been in the world, but I tell you what, when evolution hit the scene... Racism really took off. Evolution is the foundation 
for racism. Notice the title to Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. There's more to the title, as I'll show you in a minute. Now, his book came out 1859. Evolution came out way before that. Darwin just simply made the theory popular. Okay, and of course, racism was already in the world, but this book justified racism. They claim these monkeys are different species of monkeys. The origin of species. Well, they're still the same kind of creature. They're all the same. They're a monkey, okay? Here's more of the title. This book says, Darwin wrote a book titled On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Oh, now that gives you a little more of the title. But let me show you the entire title. You see, back in those days, books had long titles. Here is the entire title to Darwin's book. On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Favored races? What do you mean by that, Charlie? Do you mean one race is better than others? Oh, that's exactly what he meant, folks. Darwin was a racist. He thought natives were just advanced animals. Hmm. In Darwin's book, he said on page 243, Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals. Who are these higher and lower animals? Hmm, interesting. Well, back in 1859, of course, America still had slavery. You could buy Negroes like cows. Slavery was in America and in many other countries of the world. So uh, D Darwin's book really threw gasoline on that fire of racism. Henry Fairfield Osborne was the curator at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He said, the standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old youth of the species Homo sapien. If a museum curator said that today, how long would he keep his job? Or his life? Hmm? Stephen Gould at Harvard University said biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Thomas Huxley is the guy who got everybody believing in Darwin. Huxley said, no rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior of the white man. Priestley, the guy, who, the, the Anglican priest who really promoted Darwin, said the black people of Australia, exactly the same race as the African Negro, cannot take in the gospel. I ran a bus route for 17 years in all black neighborhoods. I have brought thousands and thousands of black people to church and to Jesus Christ, okay? And I loved the ministry. Much friendlier folks than many, okay? You go knock on the door, they invite you in, you sit down for supper, and you're sitting there eating. By the way, what's your name? <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's really a neat society to work with. I loved it. One night I couldn't sleep, so about 2 o'clock in the morning, I was out driving to my bus route. We had a ghetto-type area where I went in there, picked up kids, and brought them to church. And here it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and some guy had been out drinking, and he turned his car down what he thought was the road, but instead it was the railroad track. He drove down the railroad track a little ways, and the car bottomed out and was stuck on the rails, you know. And so I saw this unusual sight and thought I would help the guy get out of the car before a train came by and killed him. So I'm standing over there, you know, trying to get this guy out of the car so I can push his car off the track. Another man stopped to help me. And we're pushing the car back off the tracks, and the guy says, Hey, what are you doing out here in this part of town? I said, well, I run a bus over here, and I pick up folks in, uh, out of this community and bring them to church. He said, in there? He said, that's an all-black neighborhood. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know almost everybody in there. He said, you do what with them? I said, I bring them to church, you know, show them how to get saved and go to heaven. He said, those are black folks. They can't be saved. They don't, they don't have a soul. That's what he told me. I said, are, are you from the KKK? He said, how did you know? <laughs> Just a lucky guess. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's what Priestley said, too. He said, they cannot take in the gospel. All attempts to bring them to knowledge of the true God have as yet failed utterly. Poor brutes in human shape, they must perish off the face of the earth like brute beasts. This is an Anglican priest now, see, the scientists rejected Darwin when he came out. His book was written, the scientists said, this is a stupid theory. The preachers and the priests, especially in England, accepted Darwin. 
they started preaching Darwin from their pulpits. And it was the preachers that accepted Darwin before the scientists did in 1859. Here's the Mormon official doctrine. Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood. Under no circumstances can they hold this delegation of authority from the Almighty. The gospel message of salvation is not carried affirmatively to them. Negroes are not equal with other races where the receipt of certain spiritual blessings are concerned, particularly the priesthood and the temple blessings that flow therefrom. But this inequality is not of man's origin. It is the Lord's doing. It is based on his eternal laws of justice and grows out of a lack of spiritual valiance of those concerned in their first estate. What's he talking about here? The Negroes were not valiant in their first estate? I had a couple of uh, Mormon missionaries knock at my door one time. And they said, hello, Mr. Hoven, uh, we'd like to talk to you about the Lord. I said, that would be great. Which Lord would you like to talk about, yours or mine? They said, oh, there's only one Lord, the Lord God Almighty. I said, no, no, fellas, you have a very different Lord than I do. They said, no, we worship the same God. I said, no, you don't. I said, tell me, fellas, does your God have a body like mine? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, well, my Bible says uh, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in his spirit and in truth. And if he has a body, how can he be all places at the same time? Hmm. Think about it. I said, does your God live on the planet Kolob, K-O-L-O-B? They said, well, yeah, we believe he does. I said, well, I taught her science for years, which includes astronomy, and I don't have any idea where Kolob is, neither does anybody else, but let's assume that's true. I said, uh, does your God have thousands of wives? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, does your God have normal physical relations with his thousands of wives in Kolob? And they produce spirit babies. And they said, yes, we believe that's what happens. I said, and uh, if the spirit baby, the, the human couple on earth only produces the body, but your God produces the spirit, is that what you believe? They said, yes, that's what we believe. I said, now, fellas, let me tell you, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that your God has these spirit babies up on Kolob, and if they're a good spirit baby and they're valiant, they come down to earth and they get a body with white skin. If they're a bad spirit baby, they come down and get a body with black skin. Is that what you believe? They said, well, you're, you're not supposed to know that, but <clears throat> yes, that is what we believe. I said, now, fellas, listen, I know you have the tag that says elder, even though you're 17. <laughs> Let me explain something to you. Your God on Kolob has to supply a spirit for every baby born on earth. And he does it up there to supply the spirit the same way people do it down here to get the body. Is that what you're telling me? They said, yeah, that's right. I said, fellas, I taught biology and anatomy for years. I have been married 20 years at that time. It's 28 now. I said, I have three kids, one of each. I delivered one at home. I said, kids, uh, I said, fellas, there are two babies born on earth every second, 24 hours a day, round the clock, nonstop. And your God supplies a spirit for everyone. When does he get time to answer your prayers? You can see the light slowly starting to come on in the back of their little brain, like, wow, that would be tough, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so they dusted, the, you know, dusted their feet off, and I, I guess I was anathema from then on or something. They never came back, that's all I know. <laughs> what a dumb religion. But I tell you what, Islam is just as stupid. They're both the same thing, folks. Only one has a diaper on their head, but they teach their folks, look, if you're a good Mormon or if you're a good Islam, you get to go to heaven and have all these thousands of wives. It's all based on lust. That's what those religions are based on. Nothing but animal lust. Let's go on here. However, in a broad sense, general sense, caste systems have their root and origin in the gospel itself. And when they operate according to the divine decree, the resultant restrictions and segregation are right and proper and have approval of the Lord. To illustrate, Cain, Ham, and the whole Negro race have been cursed with the black skin, the mark of Cain. This is Mormon teaching, folks. Mormon apostle Mark Peterson said, If there is one drop of Negro blood in my children, as I have read to you, they receive the curse. Mormon president Brigham Young said, Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. Hmm. 
We can talk more about that if you'd like, but there are some good books about Mormonism, like well, The Secret History of Mormonism, that we cover on our video, seminar part one. You can get the title and get that book. That'll really <laughs> curl your hair. Okay. Slaves were treated like animals. They were packed into ships. They were chained to the deck. They could not move. That place where they sat on the deck is where they ate and slept and went to the bathroom. That's where they lived for three or four weeks while they sailed across the ocean. At a very high loss rate, sometimes as high as 20%, until they started packing them not quite so tight, they were just simply treated like animals. You could buy them and sell them on the open market. Some people thought the people in Australia were a classic example of a missing link because their jaw bones are bigger than average humans. And they said, see, this proves they're a missing link. Well, the reason they have bigger jaws is because Aborigines wander around in the outback. They don't want to carry a toolbox with them everywhere they go. They're a nomadic people. So <coughs> they use their teeth as a vice. They're going to clamp down on a tree branch to strip the bark off to make a tool or something. They're, they're constantly using their jaws not just for talking, but really, really hard use on the jaws, which makes the muscles get bigger. And any bodybuilder can tell you the bigger the muscles get, the bigger the bones get. Bones grow in response to muscle growth. And so they have bigger jaws because of their lifestyle, not because of evolution. But the Aborigines were rounded up and shot because people thought they were an inferior species. Every single one of them from Tasmania was killed. There are no Tasmanian Aborigines alive today. Last one killed in 1908. If you've ever seen the movie Quigley Down Under, you know, they brought Quigley out there to shoot the Aborigines. That's what they wanted him to do. That stuff really happened, folks. They were killing them. They were putting them in, making slaves out of them, doing all sorts of mean things to these Aborigines. One missionary actually witnessed this, and the story's in Creation Magazine. These two folks were going around collecting skulls for museums to be displays for missing links. Here's the story the missionary said right here. A New South Wales missionary was the horrified witness to the slaughter by mounted police of a group of dozens of aboriginal men, women, and children. Forty-five heads were then boiled down and the best ten skulls were packed off for overseas. They shot them to get their heads for museum displays. Did you know the Smithsonian has 33,000 sets of human remains in their basement? Right now? It's called the Army of the Potomac. 33,000. Did you know in 1904 in St. Louis, the World's Fair had an expedition, exposition with over 2,000 what they said were primitive people? Uh, anthropologist W.J. McGee designed the whole display. They were going to demonstrate how white man was superior. Were the... Were the uh, St. Louis World's Fair was held is now, today, the St. Louis Zoo. One of the cages that held Ota Benga is still up today, as far as I know. And it was where they kept Ota Benga in with chimpanzees. He was a pygmy from Africa. They were demonstrating how close they were to the apes. Ota had a wife and two kids. He committed suicide over this. If you want to read more on Ota Benga, get the website... Uh, rae.org. You can see a lot more about what happened to Ota Benga. President Roosevelt was influenced by all this propaganda. He believed there were inferior races also, but he thought the Indians were inferior. See, Roosevelt said, I wish very much the wrong people could be prevented entirely from breeding. He thought that immigrants from Europe, Scotland, Ireland, and the Orient were a threat to American society because they were inferior. How many of you have ancestry from one of those places? <laughs> Just about everybody in the room, right? Okay. In 1871, Congress scrapped all treaties with the Indians and moved them off to the reservation system we still have today. Because our leaders thought the evolution was true and the Indians are an inferior species. The Trail of Tears took place before Darwin's book came out, but not before the evolution theory was popular. This is when people thought they were inferior species. The Trail of Tears is when they took the Cherokees and Creek Indians and moved them off to Oklahoma. One third of them died along the way. Cherokee forced expulsion from their lands. Sam Houston lived in the, with the Cherokees, even had a Cherokee wife. 1838, the Cherokees were forced from their homes and their city, Ross's Landing, was renamed to Chattanooga so people would forget about what happened. 
Chattanooga, Tennessee, used to be called Ross's Landing, named after Chief Ross of the Cherokees. Now, the Cherokee Indians were trying very hard to blend in with the white man's way of thinking. They had farms, they taught their people an alphabet, and Ch Chief uh, Sequoia taught all, of, all the Cherokees to read in just three months. Amazing progress they had made. But they moved them off and one third of them died along the way. You ought to read about the Trail of Tears and get... But you need to understand how evolution ties in or it won't make any sense, okay? Our leaders really thought they were an inferior species. My Bible says we all have one father, okay? We all came from Adam and later from Noah. The Bible says he hath made of one blood all nations of men to rule on the earth. And if you are a racist or you think you are superior because of the color of your skin, you are a hypocrite. I wouldn't, if I know how to spell it, I'd spell it for you, but it starts with an H. Hypocrite, okay? Darwin also thought that women were inferior. He said a married man is a poor slave worse than a Negro. If a professor said that today in his class, how long would he keep his job or his life? And yet, Darwin said this, and tomorrow in school, kids are going to be taught that Darwin was a great scientist and a great man. He was a racist and a chauvinist. Darwin said, the chief distinction in intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man's attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than can woman. Whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of senses and hands, the average mental power of man must be above that of woman. Boy, Charlie finally married his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood. Nobody else would marry him. Darwin said, uh, thus from the ultimate, man has ultimately become superior to woman. Poetry, strength, voice, etc. Darwin believed in inbreeding. He married his maternal father's granddaughter, his first cousin who was also his mother's niece. They wanted to produce a superior stock. They had 10 children. Mary died shortly after birth. Anne died age 10. Robert was born retarded, died at 19 months. Henrietta had a serious breakdown at age 15. Three of his six other sons were ill so often, Charles regarded them as semi-invalids. So much for inbreeding, Charlie. Evolution is also the foundation for communism. Communism is the base is based on evolution theory that removes God and puts man in his place. The founder of the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, said communism is the goal. That's the stated purpose of the ACLU. Now Karl Marx is the founder of communism. He was originally named uh, Moses Mordecai Marx Levy, alias Karl Marx. At age 17, he wrote a beautiful paper telling of how much he loved the Lord. Then he went off to college, and a professor turned his head away from Christianity and turned him to atheism and to the occult. Wonder how many kids have gone to college and lost their faith because some professor destroyed it. I remember my first year in my first day in sociology class at Illinois Central College. The teacher got up in class and said, uh, "Are there any Christians in the room?" This is my first day in sociology class at the heathen school. I raised my hand. I said, yes, sir. Looks like I'm it. He said, what's your name? I said, Kent Hoven. He said, oh, Hoven, uh, you're a Christian, huh? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, tell me, can God do anything? This is my first day in sociology class. What are we talking about me and God for? I mean, come on, let's teach me the subject, would you? I didn't know how to answer the question, so I said, yes, God can do anything. By the way, that's not true. <laughs> Some things God cannot do. He cannot learn. He already knows it all. Right? <laughs> he cannot sin. <laughs> okay. uh, I said, yes, God can do anything. And he said, well, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? I said, well, he can make a rock so big you can't lift it. No problem. <laughs> By the way, Jesus often answered a question with a question, right? I've learned how to answer these idiots now when they say that. So he said, no, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? I'll say, well, tell me, uh, have you had geometry? And they'll typically say yes. I say, okay, good. I taught geometry for years. Now tell me, a line goes forever in both directions. Is that right? They said, that's correct. Okay. A ray goes forever in one direction. Is that right? I said, right. 
I said, okay, now let me see if I got this straight. A line goes forever in both directions. A ray goes forever in one direction. Which one is longer? <laughs> you tell me which one's longer and I'll tell you about the rock, okay? 75% of kids from Christian homes who go to public schools are going to reject the Christian faith after one year of college. Karl Marx later said, my objective in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Professor uh, Wilson at Harvard University said, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I entered the Southern Baptist Church with, when I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution theory. Destroyed his faith. Scott wrote me this letter and said, Dr. Oven, until I went to college, my faith in God was sound, but my college history class helped to destroy that faith. I started to doubt the Bible and God's word. I even started to doubt Jesus Christ was truly God's son and that he died and rose from my sins. My best friend showed me your tapes and I was in awe of what I saw. Everything I thought I knew about life was changed. I've been praying every day that I would get a chance to talk to Tom Hanks, the movie star. Because Tom Hanks, I read when he was 16, he got saved. And I just suspect his first year in college, somebody turned him on to evolution theory and turned him away from God. And that's, I just think that's what happened to Tom. And I don't know why, I'm just burdened for Tom Hanks. I pray for him every day. I want to win him back to Christ. And I'm just willing to bet what happened first or second year of college, it was this evolution theory that got him. And if somebody knows Tom, give him this tape. Tom, I love you and I'm praying for you and I'm going to get you converted before it's over with. Okay? Christianity has fought, still fights, and will fight science to the desperate end over evolution because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble, you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. Take away the meaning of his death. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. Boy, that's the truth, folks. Hmm. Karl Marx based his philosophy of communism on evolution. He even tried to dedicate his book to Charles Darwin. Dedicated to Charles Darwin from a sincere admirer, Karl Marx, 1873. Interesting. Karl Marx had six children. Three died of starvation in infancy. The guy never worked a day in his life. He's a lazy bum. That's the days before they had the little cardboard sign, you know, we'll work for food. He didn't even hold up the sign, okay. Two other kids committed suicide. When Marx died, only six people attended his funeral. He was a loser all the way around. But Karl Marx left a legacy. He left us the Communist Manifesto of 1848. There are ten planks to the Communist Manifesto. All of them are based on anything that is anti-Christian. If God's for it, Marx was against it. The first plank was to abolish private property. Hmm. The Bible's real clear about private property. You know, they had a system set up in the Bible where if you lost your property, your family would get it back every 50 years, the year of Jubilee. You couldn't possibly lose your property forever because God knows you can't have real freedom unless you have private property ownership. Christianity and uh, God's economy is based on property rights, property ownership. Every man has his own vine and his own fig tree. You provide for your own. If any man provide not for his own, he's worse than an infidel and hath denied the faith, the Bible says. Drink water out of your own cistern and running waters out of your own well, says in Proverbs chapter 5. Peter Burrell, the president of the National Audubon Society, said, we reject the idea of private property. Wow, oh, he's been reading Karl Marx, hasn't he? Here's a Pledge of Allegiance for third graders in a public school in Massachusetts. I pledge allegiance to the earth, which I do love and depend on, and to all life on land, air, and sea, which is as much a part of the earth as me. Third grade, Wisconsin Public School. I pledge allegiance to the world, to care for earth, sea, and air, to honor every living thing with peace and justice everywhere. A couple of months ago, Jacob Bredston, 
here's his phone number, told me that when he was in third grade at Johnson Elementary School in Blaine, Minnesota, his teacher, Ms. Klop Hockey, took down the American flag and made the kids pledge to the earth instead. Well, Ms. Claude Hoppy, I will buy you a one-way ticket to the Soviet Union if you promise to stay. I've been there. You don't want what they've got over there. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Hmm. There are two basic philosophies of how man ought to be governed. One is based upon evolution thinking which says laws come from man's opinion. After all, if there is no God, then we must be it, folks. We, must, we better decide what's right and wrong. Rights are granted by the government, and the government should be the provider. Government should provide everything. That's really based on evolution thinking. It's called a democracy. And democracies are terrible forms of government. I sat by a lady on the airplane coming up here who was telling me how the government ought to do this and the government ought to do that and the government ought to provide this and I said, ma'am, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. Did you know our founding fathers had a different philosophy? They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Hey, where do rights come from? They come from the creator. Do you have the right to get married? Yeah. Where does this right come from? God. Well, then why do we ask the state for permission? A lot of folks don't understand, but if you get a state marriage license, you've now entered into a contract between you and your husband or wife and the state you live in, and any children you produce belong to the state. And they can come take them away if they don't like the way you're raising them. And it all starts with that marriage contract. There was no such thing as a marriage license until about 100 years ago. Listen to the preacher. It makes me nervous when I hear him say that. By the authority invested in me by the state of Wisconsin, I now pronounce you man and wife. Now, you want to study that subject out real carefully. Get the website hushmoney.com or .org. You can get a lot more on that. Hushmoney.com. Here it is. Same thing with churches. Why do churches ask the government for permission to exist by becoming a 501c3 corporation? You better, t Peter Kershaw had written the book, not only Hush Money, but also uh, In Caesar's Grip, that you better read before you decide you want your church to be incorporated. See, our ministry, CSE ministry, is not incorporated. It's not a 501c3 corporation. And we have a very interesting time with the county officials in our county because they think they have authority over our ministry. And they don't. God has authority over it, and Christians died by the millions to preserve that fundamental right. We'll get into more of that some other time. But our founding fathers believed that this country was founded by Christians on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The other philosophy is what our founding fathers had, that creation is, is true, and laws come from the creator, rights are unalienable, and the government should be limited to two things. Punish evildoers and defend us from outside invaders. Those are the only two legitimate functions of government. They should not be involved in welfare. They should not be involved in education. It's called a constitutional republic. That's how it started, folks. But evolution says, oh, no, man's in charge, so we better decide truth and better decide right and wrong. And it all, the basic philosophies of government are really based on creation or evolution. Second plank in Karl Marx's manifesto was a heavy progressive income tax. Don't get me started on that one. We have a long 30-page letter we can send you on that one. Send our office a few bucks to cover copies, and we'll send you our 30-page letter about this topic right here. Okay? The third one was abolish the rights of inheritance. The huh. Bible says a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. Karl Marx wanted to abolish the rights of inheritance. See, if God's for it, he's against it. Number four, confiscate property rights. Number five, a central bank. Remember, love of money, root of all evil. 1913, we got a creature from Jekyll Island, Georgia, called the Federal Reserve. You ought to read that book and find the history behind the Federal Reserve. Nothing federal about it, and there are no reserves. It's no more federal than the Federal Express or Federal Rifle Shells. Okay. 
Love of money root of all evil. The Bible says the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. You see, the rich folks wanted to figure out a way to get all of the money. They would like everybody in debt to them so that when you work, part of your money goes to them, even though they didn't do the work. You did the work, but they get part of the money. That's how debt works, isn't it? If you borrow money for a house or a car, well, then you work to pay for, to give some of it away. Interesting. For centuries, the alchemists sought for ways to turn lead into gold. They failed. But the bankers discovered a way to do it. Start wars and finance both sides. Interesting. After the lead stops flying, the gold rolls in as interest payments on the national debt. Did you know during World War II, U.S. debt rose almost 600%, Japanese debt rose 1,300%, French debt rose almost 600%, Canadian debt rose 400%. Debt to who? Who do we owe this money to? What's the national debt now? Like 17 trillion when they're really honest and put all the numbers on the table? Who do we owe this money to? Every one of you is carrying in your wallet or your purse evidence of our debt. You want to see it? This is not a $5 bill. This is a debt note. This is proof of our debt. Federal Reserve note. This is not money, folks. That'd take a long time to explain all that, but the national debt is absolutely staggering. See, uh, Nehemiah said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and upon our lands and vineyards, and lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. I'm afraid we've got our sons and grand, grandsons and great-grandsons in debt already right now, folks. Here's to give you a little bit of the history of the love of money and how this ties in. Okay? In 1776, we fought a war with England and gained independence from England and from the Bank of England. Only Congress had power to coin money. Jefferson warned if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of currency, by the way, Federal Reserves are private banks, okay? First by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. In 1792, Alexander Hamilton established a 20-year charter with the Bank of England. Big mistake, Alex. In 1812, renewal was denied and war broke out. England said, okay, charter's up. We want the colonies back. That's what the War of 1812 was really about, okay? 1833, Andrew Jackson removed all monies from the chartered banks and put them into state banks. In 1836, the rich men, the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, these kind of guys, had Mexico invade Texas, started a war to punish America for not keeping their money in the, his banks. In 1861, these same rich men helped create the Civil War to disrupt the economy. They wanted to create debt and get their power back. See, they have power when everybody's in debt to them. They love it when Congress issues more money because they just print it and it's more debt. In 1861, the Industrial Revolution created great wealth in the hands of a few. You ought to read the book, The Robber Barons, for more on that. In 1907, banker J.P. Morgan deliberately created the financial panic to promote the idea of a central bank. In 1912, the communist Marxist Colonel House, who was Wilson's uh, alter ego, he was in the Wilson administration, he wrote a book called Philip Drew, Administrator, to explain his conspiracy to establish a central bank and create a progressive income tax. 1913, Federal Reserve Act was passed and Federal Income Tax Act was passed. December 23rd, two days before Christmas, the Federal Reserve Act passed, then the 16th Amendment was passed. Now this is the greatest hoax in history. All the senators had gone home. This is Christmas. Colonel House walks in, announces to practically an empty Senate, the 16th Amendment has passed. Now, when an amendment passes, all the states have to ratify it. When this 16th Amendment to allow for the income tax went out to all the different states, almost every state didn't even vote on it. When it came up for issue, they said, this is unconstitutional. We passed. We're not going to vote on it. So when they said passed, that didn't mean they agreed. That means they didn't want to vote on it. 
The 16th Amendment was never ratified. The law that never was, okay? That's a long, interesting story. Anyway, uh, in 1916, Wilson, reflecting on the Federal Reserve Act, said, I have unwittingly ruined my country. From 1920 to 1929, the bankers increased the money supply by 62% to create the Roaring Twenties and brought people into the stock market. October 1929, the bankers called in their loans and sent the economy into the Great Depression. This was intentionally done. And then helped create the New Deal programs where they could loan the government money to rescue the economy. And guess who we're in debt to? Same guys. In June 1932, Congressman Louis McFadden gave his powerful speech to Congress spelling out who had caused the Depression. On the third try, they finally had him assassinated. Congressman Louis McFadden. There was also Lindbergh was very much out, outspoken against uh, the banking system, and he ended up getting his baby kidnapped and murdered because of this same issue. Okay? 1933, the government debt to the bankers began to grow steadily. Millions readily accepted a social security number, hmm. which, by the way, is voluntary, and I don't have one. Okay? The rich men then tricked people into getting a social security number in order to get their benefits from the government. As usual, they created a crisis, the Depression, to encourage compliance. Here's an original social security card. Look what it says, not for identification. Hmm. New ones, you have to have for, social, for identification for just about everything, don't you? Look, if anybody asks for your social security number, just say, it's none of your business. I applied for insurance, and they said, uh, I, for life insurance. And they said, oh, you don't have a social security number. Can't have insurance. I wrote them a letter. I said, I'd like insurance. Please insure me. They said, no, nope, not without a social security number. So we're suing them for big bucks for discriminating against me. That should come to a head in the next couple of weeks. Call me and I'll let you know how it turns out. I may able to be, might be able to fly all of you down to Florida to see our place. Okay? Here's a, go to the local post office and pick up a draft notice for you kids, selective service. Look what it says here. If you have a social security number, it is mandatory you include this information. If you don't have one, leave this block blank. It is not mandatory to have a social security number. They want you to think it is, but it is totally voluntary. What happened, we traded our real money, which is silver and gold, for worthless paper. Real soon, those who control the real money will require all transactions to be controlled electronically by an embedded chip. I have in my wallet a $5 Federal Reserve note from 1928. Very interesting reading. Look what it says here. Redeemable in gold on demand at the United States Treasury or in gold or lawful money at any Federal Reserve Bank. What are they, what are they telling me? I can trade this in for gold or I can trade it in for lawful money. Isn't that what it says? You mean this is not lawful money? Uh, no, this is a Federal Reserve note. This is a debt note. This is not money. We've got a whole generation now who grows up thinking this is money, and it is not money, folks. It is a note. It's a debt note. That would be a long, interesting study. Also, you may want to get into. Then in 1933, a couple of years after this was issued, President Roosevelt declared to Congress of Governors that a national state of emergency existed. The Great Depression was going on. So the governors voted unanimously to give the president emergency power to wage war on the economy. Hmm. These powers would not be available under normal constitutional process. March 1933, Congress voted to give the President of the United States and to the Secretary of the Treasury the emergency powers sanctioned to wage war through executive orders. Abraham Lincoln issued the first executive order to bring troops into the South. And by the way, I love my country, but the wrong side won that war. That war was not about slavery. That war was about states' rights. That's another long, interesting story. But in uh, 1933, Section 5B of the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 was amended to include the citizens of the United States. By the way, capital U, capital S, 
you don't want to be a citizen of that one. You want to be a citizen of the small U, capital S. That's another long, interesting story. Okay. By and through their ability to own gold and silver as an enemy of the United States. In 1933, they said, if you own gold, you're an enemy of the country. Everybody turned their gold in to the government, 1933. Then in 1934, this note was issued, which I have in my collection at home. It says right here, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and is redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury or at any Federal Reserve Bank. That's still not lawful money, folks. It's fraudulent. See, the note is evidence of debt, not money. The Coinage Act of 1792, which has never been revoked, defines a dollar as 25.8 grains of gold or 412 grains of silver. That's why a silver dollar was always the same size. It had to be 90% silver and had to weigh a certain amount. And it was a real lawful dollar. Here's the new euro currency. European common market. Interesting. Notice the woman riding on the beast here in both the coins and the dollars. Revelation 17. He carried me away into the spirit, in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The beast has seven heads and ten horns on the European currency. Interesting. Here's the Bank of England 